my name is Fuad. Oh, sorry. Um, I work here at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research as a bioinformatician. Uh, a few years ago, I used to work in the production team, so I was exposed to uh, RNA-seq data, uh, and I was responsible for assembling RNA-seq pipeline uh, for production team at OACR. And um, today, we're going to be talking about gene expression, uh, but also RNA-seq. Um, I'll talk about RNA-seq technology, uh, how it works, how libraries are prepared, and uh, alignment, expression, uh, the, the whole thing. These slides are actually adapted from another workshop that we run uh, through CBW, the RNA-seq workshop, which lasts two days. So uh, this is just an introduction. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about RNA-seq in depth, then you can take that uh, workshop where you get to do, do more tutorials and you get to learn uh, more concepts uh, in RNA-seq. <coughs> So I'm splitting the um, morning module into three sections. So the, the way it's going to work today is that the first two hours uh, we're going to be doing just a lecture, and then we're going to have a coffee break, and then we'll do a tutorial all together um, where we have a small data set. We can write an alignment and do expression and do differential expression. Uh, hopefully we'll have time to do all of that. If not, I have all the commands listed in the tutorial so you can run things on your, on your own after. Um, so the three parts for uh, this morning uh, the first part of, of, it will be introduction to RNA sequencing. Then I'll move into uh, RNA alignment and visualization. And finally, I'll end with uh, expression and uh, differential expression. And feel free to ask me <clears throat> sorry, questions. Uh, if there's something you don't understand, you can just raise your hand and stop me, and uh, I'll be more than happy to, to answer it. Um, so for each part, I'll go over the learning objectives of, the, uh, of that part before I get into it. So the learning objectives of the first part is uh, an introduction to the theory on practices of RNA sequencing, um, rationale behind uh, RNA sequencing, the challenges that we face uh, with RNA sequencing data, and uh, the general goals and themes of uh, RNA-seq workflows and analysis. And I end with uh, common technical questions that a lot of people ask when they start working with RNA-seq data. And these, these are questions that I asked uh, as well when I started working on uh, RNA-seq. And I'll provide some suggestions and solutions to those uh, questions as well that might help you establish your own pipeline network. Uh, sorry, before I get started, <clears throat> how I just want to show hands how many people have actually worked with RNA-seq data. Okay. And how many people um, who worked on RNA-seq data worked on human RNA-seq? Okay. Uh, any other uh, organism species? Just I'm curious to, to know. Yes. Okay. Fine. <laughs> uh, anything else? So, sorry? Mouse. Mouse? Okay. Corn? Corn? Ah, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, so the focus today will be on uh, human, but you can take these uh, concepts and apply them to uh, uh, other or organisms and, and species that you're, you're working with. <clears throat> so in genetics, uh, gene expression is considered to be the most fundamental level um, at which genotype actually gives rise to phenotype. And through gene expression, you will, will learn a lot of things like what genes are expressed um, what triggers genes to be, uh, to, to be turned on and off, uh, how genes interact with each other in pathways, and uh, why certain genes and certain cell types um, uh, manufacture certain proteins. Um, all that information is available uh, through um, gene expression, and there are a variety of ways you can actually uh, assess gene expression or measure the abundance uh, of genes in the genome. Um, <clears throat> Some of the platforms that we can use to, uh, to do that uh, are uh, qPCR, uh, we have microarrays, we have uh, uh, northern blots, uh, uh, but late, lately a lot of studies have been using RNA-seq. And the reason why people are moving towards RNA-seq is because RNA-seq data seems to be uh, uh, accurate, sensitive. Uh, it's also not restricted to specific gene annotation. So if you don't, even if you don't have uh, a reference genome, you can still uh, can, uh, do sequencing and uh, do de novo assembly uh, after. These are things that you could not do with microarrays. Um, and you can also discover novel genes. You can uh, uh, discover uh, novel transcripts. Uh, also, the data that you get is very rich. Not only do you have gene expression, but you can look at 
many other data types like fusions, you can look at isoforms, you can look at mutations in the RNA-seq, uh, and so on. And these are things that you cannot really obtain uh, using other uh, platforms. Uh, in, tr in terms of money, it's actually very cost-effective. The cost of sequencing is, is uh, going down, so it will be a lot cheaper and uh, more feasible to do RNA sequencing uh, in the future. And also the, uh, the dynamic range. Just because it's cost effective, the dynamic range of expression, there isn't really a limit. Uh, if you have more money, you can sequence more and you can add more depth uh, to, to your uh, sequencing. Uh, so this shows just a, an overflow of our, what RNA sequencing uh, uh, workflow uh, is like. Don't worry about it. I'll go into the details uh, each step, and I'll explain it uh, in a bit. Now, why do we sequence RNA? What kind of information does RNA uh, provide us that DNA does not provide us? Um, for example, if you're interested in some functional studies that uh, uh, can look at uh, certain conditions or drugs, for example, and you're trying to compare different cell lines and you want to see the effect of a, a specific drug on, uh, on two cell lines, uh, a lot of times in those functional studies, uh, those drugs actually affect the transcriptome and they do not affect uh, the genome. Uh, and uh, it, you run RNA seq to be able to compare the two conditions and the outcome uh, of the drug on, 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 on the two uh, populations. Uh, also, predicting transcript uh, um, sequences is really hard uh, by just looking at the uh, DNA itself. Uh, it will be a lot easier uh, if you do RNA seq and uh, use that to predict the transcript uh, um, sequences. Uh, and also, uh, some molecular features, as I mentioned before, they are only present in the RNA, like uh, uh, alternate isoforms, uh, fusion transcripts, and RNA editing. And these are things that you cannot uh, obtain from uh, DNA sequences. Um, in addition, you can also combine uh, the RNA data with DNA. Uh, and that will help you uh, evaluate, uh, for example, somatic mutations that you obtain in DNA. Uh, you, you evaluate the severeness of those mutations. So let's say, for example, you have a somatic mutation uh, in, the, in the DNA, uh, but there is no expression in that gene at the RNA level. Then you might not be as interested in that mutation. But let's say there is a mutation, uh, but the wild type of that gene is actually expressed, then that could suggest a loss of uh, functionality. Uh, but uh, more interesting, if there is a mutation uh, uh, and then you see uh, an expression in the, uh, in the allele that's mutated, that could actually be very interesting because that might be a drug uh, target that you want to uh, go after. Um, RNA is great. However, there are a lot of challenges that uh, we face uh, and you will face when dealing with uh, RNA, RNA-seq. Um, the first challenge is uh, sample related. So uh, a lot of the samples, uh, when you get them, you have to consider the purity of the sample, uh, the quantity, do you have enough to actually uh, uh, run uh, RNA-seq technology, uh, the quality of the sample, is the quality good enough, can I move forward, uh, is it worth it that I take it forward and actually uh, perform RNA sequencing since uh, it, it, it's expensive and a waste of money if you take samples that are bad quality and you, and you run the RNA-seq uh, and then it, it turns out that you can't use any of the data that you sequenced. Um, and uh, another challenge that we face when aligning uh, RNA-seq uh, reads is that the reference that we use is a genome reference that consists of introns and exons. However, RNA-seq data only consists of coding regions, so only exons. So you're trying to map exons to uh, regions that have exons and introns. So you have a lot of uh, large gaps that the aligners have to deal with. And that's, that's a bioinformatic uh, computational uh, challenge. Uh, also, the, um, the, uh, the abundancy, uh, the, the, the relative uh, abundance of uh, uh, expression uh, varies a lot. So you have genes that have very small expression, while genes that have extremely high expressions. And that extremely high expression uh, genes, uh, they vary also across uh, samples. And sometimes, the high expressed genes, what they do is they can actually consume some of the reads uh, from the other genes uh, in, in the genome. And that could lead to false positive results when you're doing uh, comparisons between uh, the samples and you could uh, get false positive uh, differentially expressed genes. So that's another thing that you have to keep in mind uh, when dealing with uh, RNA-seq. Um, also the sizes of the genes vary, the number of exons within genes vary. Um, and this variation 
can lead also to biases in terms of the coverage. So maybe very long genes, uh, the coverage might not be uniform across uh, the, the transcript or, or the gene uh, as compared to small genes. And if there is any bias that's coming from uh, like technical bias through library prep, it will affect uh, small genes or large genes more than uh, uh, vice versa. So uh, the, the size of the, uh, of the genes is, is variable. And these are things that might not be present in DNA when you're sequencing DNA, uh, uh, but are present in RNA and you have to uh, consider. Also, RNA is fragile compa compared to DNA. So uh, when you're handling RNA, RNA is easily degraded. So that's another thing that you have to look at uh, before you start processing your RNA. Um, so speaking of RNA being uh, uh, fragile, uh, the first step that you must conduct before you uh, carry on sequencing or library prep is to check the quality of your RNA. And um, previously, people used to use bioanalyzer, uh, electrophoretic uh, trace plots. So for those of you who don't know what that is, um, you're simply what you're doing is you're running your RNA through a gel and you're getting uh, different bands on your gel. And each band represents uh, a subunit uh, in RNA. Now, RNA, or the RNA pool in the cell consists mainly of ribosomal RNA. Most of the RNA in the cell is ribosomal, and the two big subunits in ribosomal RNA is the 18S unit and 28S uh, unit. Um, so if you, uh, so, so the, the plot uh, here is showing uh, the size of the uh, molecule that you're looking at, and then uh, on the y-axis you're looking at the fluorescence uh, signal that you're getting from, uh, from, from the gel. Um, and a good, uh, a good, an example of a good RNA is uh, the, the plot on the, on the right, uh, where you're seeing two clear, very clear bands of the 18S and 28S, uh, 28S units uh, in the ribosome. Uh, and uh, the rest of the RNA is so tiny that you can't really uh, observe it compared to the, to the two uh, subunits. Now, as RNA uh, 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 degrades, what happens is that it, it gets chunks uh, split into small, smaller pieces. And when you run them through the gel, you will then observe more than just two subunits because you're uh, disintegrating the, the RNA. So you'll start seeing multiple peaks in the trace plot. And that's the ex an example of the plot to the left. So you're seeing a lot of fragments in the RNA, and that's, that's not good. Um, now, instead of looking through trace plots to try to figure out uh, whether the RNA is good or bad, uh, Agilent has come up with a software called RIN, uh, which stands for RNA Integrity Number, where through some machine learning, they've gone through all the trace plots and they try to come up with one score that you can look at and try to assess whether the RNA is good or bad. Um, and those scores are actually, uh, I've put them right underneath the trace plot. So the plot on the left has a RIN score of 6, while the plot on the right has a RIN score of 10. Uh, the range is 0 to 10, 0 being uh, uh, very degraded and 10 being uh, intact. And what you're interested in, usually we pick RNA uh, samples that have a RIN of 7 or higher, uh, but a lot of times you're given samples that have very uh, low RIN and it's just bad quality. Now, and then you ask yourself, what do I do? You tell them it's bad, they say, no, go ahead and sequence it. Um, so what I suggest is that instead of like doing the whole batch or sequencing the whole batch, you do a pilot study, run one sample, see what, what kind of data you can get out of it, and if you can't get data out of it, then you can go back and sequence the rest. But if you sequence it and it's terrible and you can't get anything out of it, then there's no point in, uh, in doing that, and maybe you should ask for uh, better samples. Um, so once you make sure that your RNA is uh, good, then you can uh, go ahead and start the library uh, prep. And that, that process is also complex. And the reason why I, I say it's complex is because there are so many kits out there uh, in the market that are available. Um, how do you choose? How do you decide which kit do I use uh, to create my uh, RNA libraries? Now, that is solely dependent on the, the purpose or what you're interested in. So the, the first step is you take your tissues, you isolate the RNA, and then you run uh, DNAs. DNAs, what it does, it breaks down the DNA in your, uh, uh, in your uh, RNA pool so that there is no DNA contamination. And once that's done, you're left with an RNA pool. 
Now that RNA pool, as I've mentioned before, there's a lot of ribosomal RNA. And it's a mix of coding and non-coding RNA. Um, now, choosing a, a kit to prepare a library uh, will depend on what you want. Are you interested in non-coding RNAs, um, long non-coding RNAs? If you are, then you start with a total RNA, which consists of everything, and then you can run a, a ribosomal a depletion. So that's another kit like ribo zero or ribo minus, if you've ever heard of those. Uh, what it does is that it eliminates the ribosomal content in your total RNA. And then you're left with coding and non-coding RNA that you can use uh, downstream. Now, if you're not interested in, uh, in non-coding RNA, and only interested in the coding regions, you can take your total RNA and then uh, run a, a, a poly-A selection or poly-A enrichment. So what that means is that uh, the, R the RNA uh, fragments, they get processed and uh, a poly, a series of A bases are attached to them. Uh, and those, those RNA fragments are actually uh, mature RNAs that uh, contain coding sequences. So those are the ones that you're interested in if you're interested in coding sequences only. And poly-A enrichment just pulls all the RNA fragments that have those uh, poly-A tails only. Uh, so you can do that, or you can do a cDNA, cDNA capture if you're interested in, a, in certain uh, genes or certain regions in the transcriptome. Uh, so you can think of it as exome uh, capture. That's what uh, cDNA uh, capture. Uh, so again, it's very dependent on when you're interested in, and, uh, uh, and there are so many kits available in the market to, to do that. Um, another thing that you might want to consider is uh, whether or not you want to pick a stranded versus unstranded libraries. So um, five years ago, the concept of stranded libraries did not exist. All the libraries that were uh, available were unstranded. So what that means is that when you sequence the reads that you get will not tell you uh, where the expression is actually happening. What strand uh, is that read coming from? Um, so, uh, uh, for example, the, the left uh, top uh, plot right there, uh, you, you have two genes that are being trans transcribed in two opposite directions, uh, and you get reads that are piled. Uh, but the thing is, the reads that pile, they're coming from both strands, so you can't tell what strand it's coming from. Now, with the uh, uh, introduction of strand-specific libraries, you can actually um, tell. So the reads that pile on top of that gene will tell you what strand it came from. Um, and that, uh, you, might, you might say, why do I need that? What's, why is it helpful? Um, it's helpful because a lot of times you might not have uh, uh, the gene annotation for your uh, species or uh, you don't have a reference genome so you don't really know what direction your gene is supposed to be transcribed so this is good for novel genes it will tell you what uh, the direction is or what strand it's actually being transcribed from uh, also if there are any overlaps or genes that overlap uh, with unstranded libraries you can't really tell where um, the reads are coming from is it uh, uh, this gene or this gene uh, but with strand specific libraries you can actually separate and you can tell uh, uh, where the reads are coming from um, for, for those, and then it provides better uh, expression estimation for those genes that overlap. Yes? For well, human, so that doesn't matter, right? Or yes, human, yeah, human doesn't matter, but yes, uh, other genomes, that might be uh, an issue. Uh, yeah. yeah? Yeah, so you said was the, uh, so was the earlier method, you couldn't separate the strands. If you read the um, legend of the actually says blue and red where the strands are coming from. Um, so I think that's just the, the, the sequencing. So uh, when you sequence the fragment, you take it and then you see, are you sequencing from this side or this side? Right. Um, but it doesn't tell you that where the transcription is actually happening for that specific gene. Uh, not how you're sequencing. So the color, co the color coding for the unstranded is just how you're sequencing it. But the color coded for the stranded is oh. where the transcription is okay. happening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Did you talk about how that works? Sorry, I'm not going to talk about that. No, uh, but I can provide you with ar articles on that. Yes. Can we go back to why stranded isn't important for humans? Sorry, the why stranded isn't important for humans? It's not uh, because the, there aren't many overlaps uh, in terms of uh, uh, in the gene. So may, you other you genomes. Don't use the same exons in two directions. Yes, yeah, so I don't know what percentage of the uh, of the genome actually, or the genes are actually there are overlaps. 
I would say so too. There's yeah. a lot of linear yeah. RNAs that would be compounding. Yeah, but then I, I believe there are other uh, uh, genomes where there, it's, it's it's more of an issue. Uh, so it's it's always recommended. Yeah, so it's always recommended to use Trended because that information is useful. The procedure is a bit more complex when you prepare the library, uh, but it's, it's, it's always better to use that because you can do a little specific expression and so many other things that you can't do with unstranded uh, libraries. Yeah. It's not as severe, that's what you I meant could, to say. You can always infer a little specific expression from unstranded because you have the snits in the RNAs, but it would always be a guess. Yeah, correct. Um, now, when it comes to designing the uh, the experiment that you're uh, you're running for RNA seq, uh, it's it's really crucial to have uh, replicates. And when I say replicates, there are two types of replicates. I'm talking about technical replicates, where uh, it's the same sample, but you're running it on uh, either different flow cells, different lanes in the flow cells, uh, different day. Uh, you just want to make sure that the data that you're generating is reproducible uh, with uh, technical replicates. Um, you also need biological replicates, and those are different samples that uh, were, uh, uh, they, they, under, they, they had the same condition, um, or uh, the same drug, for example, and, uh, and those biological replicates, the dispersion or the variation in those will also help you downstream when you were looking at uh, genes that are differentially expressed. And a simple plot, the first plot that you can generate is you can look at cor correlation between the technical replicates, and that will give you an idea of how reproducible uh, your data is. And you're interested in, uh, in, in very highly reproducible data, so we're looking at coefficient, coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient of uh, 0.92 to 0.98. Anything that's really high is, is good. Sorry, did you say you want the technical or the biological? Technical. We, you need both. You need technical replicates and you need biological replicates. A lot of times people don't, uh, from experience, no one does technical replicates. Uh, they, they do a lot of biological replicates, so you get one, one run per uh, sample. But that was an issue because it was uh, costly to uh, actually do multiple uh, uh, copies of the same uh, sample. But it's, it's highly recommended now that um, uh, sequencing is getting cheaper to actually have technical replicates as well as biological uh, replicates. Okay, so, sorry. sorry, in your opinion, have you actually seen technical replicates not being, not being consistent with each other? Um, I, I personally haven't because I haven't worked with a lot of technical replicates. Um, but uh, that's, it, it, it's very likely, especially if, you're, if you uh, run a sample on two different flow cells, uh, there is always a lot of variations when, uh, when you're doing uh, experiments. And uh, flow cell to flow cell, there are a lot of uh, differences as well. Uh, so that you have to consider that as well. So yes. I wanted to add to that, especially in cancer, when you're dealing with uh, clonal heterogeneity, like even if you're dealing with um, in vitro you know, dishes, uh, something like clonal heterogeneity might really affect the results. So in terms of technical replicates, it might be very useful. That's true. Biological replicates Yeah, if you have biological, great. Let's, but let's, say well. let's say you're limited to four samples because it's budget and it does cost up to $100 to prepare a library. You have four biological It's better than two biological and yeah. two technicals. I agree. Who does it for $10? <laughs> 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 so I said it's a couple of hundred dollars for to prepare yeah, a library. Couple, who does it for a couple of hundred dollars? For library. It's just, just library print, and there's the sequencing. I've got a question for you. Yes. So you take, let's say I give you three technical replicates. Yeah. That tells you how good your sequencing is, yeah. right? how much noise there is. So then, okay, then you make a, then you make a mean, then you make a mean of them in some way, yeah. right? And then I give you three biological replicates. Then you compare your... <coughs> So you have control to the each of the biological replicates. Correct. Well, you do means of everything, and then you compare them. Correct. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the simplest approach. Uh, I will show you later. There are a lot of very advanced techniques. Uh, they will do similar approach, but different tests. Probably. How do you run the mean of three samples? How do you run the mean of three samples? Yeah. One gives you, let's say, three mutations in the gene. The other one gives you two. The other one gives you one. 
Well, here we're looking at expression. So we were looking at read counts. Um, so you're averaging read counts. We're not averaging expression. Uh, read counts, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Questions? Um, so here is just a list of some of the uh, uh, common uh, goals of RNA uh, uh, sequencing. So as I've mentioned before, you can get uh, gene expression, differential expression. Uh, you can look at alternate expression analysis. You can do transcript discovery and annotation. Uh, you can do allele-specific expression, mutation discovery, fusion detection, RNA editing. So there's so many different things that you can do uh, with, with the data that you get. Today's focus is going to be on uh, gene expression and differenti differential expression. Uh, and uh, we won't be covering the uh, the other uh, topics. Um, so the most of the wor uh, the RNA seq workflows consist of the following series of events. You're taking your sequences, which are in a FASTQ file. It's a text file that contains all the sequences that you obtain from the sequencer. Um, you take those sequences and you do some sort of quality check. So you run those through a tool that checks the quality of the sequences to make sure that there is no uh, bias, that the, the context of the sequences is okay. Uh, the, one of the most popular tools that are used uh, nowadays is FastQC, and all you do is just FastQC and you give it the, uh, the directory where all the FastQ files are, and then it goes through them and it generates PDF uh, uh, reports of the quality of the uh, sequences. Um, then that is followed by an alignment. So you take those reads or fast cues and then you give them to an aligner and um, we'll talk about different align aligner aligners in a bit but the general concept is you take the fast cue threes, you align them, you get another file which will SAM or BAM <clears throat> which contains the same exact sequences that you started with but now you're adding more annotation. You're adding where the sequence was aligned, uh, if they're th the pair, where the pair is aligned, what was the alignment quality uh, and all that information is uh, in the BAM file. Now that BAM file is, is very important because you can take it now and then pass it through uh, so many different tools and packages. You can run it through tools that will do uh, different, uh, uh, expression and differential expression. You can run it through tools that will do fusions. You can run it through tools that will do variant calling. Uh, and the output for each one of these tools is going to be different. But mainly it will be just a text file, a VCF or a BED, um, that will uh, uh, summarize the results from each one of these tools. And at the end of the day, you also want to do some sort of summarization or visual visualization. And I find that R is very helpful when it comes to that because there are a lot of packages that you can use to uh, visualize uh, and generate plots to visualize uh, these data sets. Um, jumping to the common questions that get asked when uh, you deal with uh, RNA-seq. So the first question that um, get, gets asked is, should I remove duplicates for RNA-seq data? Now, if you're not familiar with, with uh, uh, duplicates, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go over what that means. Uh, in DNA, when you're uh, preparing libraries, you enrich for DNA through uh, running Q, uh, sorry, PCR, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction. So you take the reads and then you go through cycles of replication to enrich for those reads to get more reads that you can sequence. But in that process, um, that process can be biased. So some regions in the genome can actually get amplified more than others. And what ends up happening is that uh, instead of getting uh, uniform uh, distribution or overlapping reads, you end up with reads that pile up uh, in one region of the genome. So you look at a region and there is like thousands of reads that pile up with the same exact start and end position. And uh, those are technical artifacts because those are not true reads coming from the sample itself, but those are reads that you are introducing uh, by PCR. And if there is an error in one of these reads, that error will be amplified uh, uh, in this bias and you will end up with false positive results. So in DNA, what they do is they collapse the reads. So if there are reads that have the same exact and start uh, uh, points, you assume that the start point should be random in the genome. There is no uh, reason why the start point should be uh, at a specific point. So you just collapse all the reads to one read. Uh, and there are tools that will do that. One example is Picard that will be able to collapse your reads for you. Now, when it comes to RNA, can you do the same? Um, 
you have to consider a few things. Unlike DNA, the start points of the reads are actually not very random because you're looking at transcription, and transcription has specific start sites. So it's not random. That's number one. If you try to collapse, that will actually affect the dynamic range of the expression in your sample. So uh, it hasn't been proven that uh, PCR introduces artifacts in RNA-seq yet. Uh, but what you can do is you can try it yourself. You can try to collapse the reads and look at the uh, expression uh, profiles for your genes or for your samples before and after collapsing and see how much it actually changes. And if you're planning on doing that, don't do it on single reads. Try to do the pair. So you, you make sure that the, the whole fragment, the beginning of the first read and the end of the uh, second read actually match exactly. And what would be even better is you compare the sequences and make sure that the sequences match uh, uh, exactly before you do the collapsing. Yes? How do you define duplicates? So those are reads that have the same sequence and they have the same start and end point. Same exact start and end point. And so that doesn't, that doesn't depend on levels of gene expression? Are we talking RNA or DNA? RNA. RNA. Um, well, that's the thing. It, it will. Because um, in, in DNA, as I said, uh, those uh, duplicates, they are purely coming from PCR artifacts. But in RNA, you can't tell whether it's PCR or it's transcription. So that's why it, you have to be very careful when you're uh, performing the collapsing. Because when you collapse, you might actually collapse uh, biologically relevant transcription information uh, instead of PCR. That's pretty common. Uh, so we don't uh, collapse RNA seq, um, and I, we don't have a way to actually assess uh, the PCR artifact. Uh, I'll show you when we do the QC uh, plots one way to, that you can get a better idea of how much duplication there is, a potential duplication, and then uh, it's up to you whether you you want to collapse or not collapse. So yeah, so again, that also depends on what kind of analysis. If you're doing expression, don't collapse. If you're doing uh, variant calling, then maybe it's a good idea to collapse and then do variant calling. Yeah. yeah. So that's a decision. It's up to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question uh, that gets asked a lot is how much uh, library depth is needed for RNA-C? How many lanes do I need? How many reads do I need? Um, with DNA, it's very straightforward. You can say, OK, if I'm doing a normal sample and a tumor sample, uh, with normal, I want an average of 50x coverage, uh, or sorry, 30x coverage, and tumor, I want 60x coverage. And what I mean by that is, when you say 60x, you're saying, I want every base in my genome to have 60 reads that cover it approximately, if you're looking at an average across the genome. Now, with RNA, that's not really, uh, you can't really do that because um, the expression of the genes uh, varies and the more reads, some genes that are highly expressed will have more reads than genes that are not expressed. Um, so that, that, that's uh, a challenge uh, when, it, when it comes to that. And there are so many different variables that you have to consider when you consider uh, read depth. So um, first, first thing you need to consider is your analysis plan. What are you interested in doing? Are you doing gene expression? Uh, if so, then you'll probably need more reads. Are you doing fusions? Are you doing mutation calling? And each one of these will require different uh, uh, read depth. Um, uh, but it's safe to go with a high read depth so you can actually later be able to get all these different data types and not, uh, uh, not be limited uh, with your read depth. Um, another uh, dependency is your uh, tissue uh, type, your, the RNA protocol that you used. Just like I showed you earlier, if you use total RNA, you're going to get very small uh, coding uh, uh, regions. So the, the, you probably need more reads uh, for total RNA if, you, if you're interested in coding uh, regions. Um, the quality of the RNA, if you start with bad quality, if the RIN is not very high, you probably need more depth than uh, 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 high quality RNA. And um, sequencing. There's a lot of uh, parameters that you have to consider as well when you're sequencing. Uh, what kind of machine you're using? Uh, are you doing single-end sequencing or paired-end sequencing? What's the read length? Um, nowadays, reads can go up on high seq and go up to 150. 
uh, are you doing 50, uh, uh, 2 by 50, 2 by 100, 2 by 150? Uh, so all of these factors you have to consider. And that could be overwhelming if you're just starting and someone asks you that and you're like, I don't know, like there are just too many variables. So maybe the first thing you should do is write down all these variables and then go and, and look for a study that has done something similar to what you have done and see what uh, coverage they have done. And uh, it's recommended that, again, you do a pilot study. So take these parameters, uh, take those coverages, run one sample, see if that's enough. And uh, in the QC section, I'll also show you some plots, QC plots, that will tell you whether or not you've sequenced enough uh, through uh, splice junction saturation plots, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but once you have enough, then you can go back and sequence everything else. If you don't have enough, you can go back and increase um, the, the depth. Now, just to give you an idea as well, um, uh, flow cells on like Illumina, each flow cell contains, uh, has eight lanes, and each lane uh, on a flow cell can actually generate about, uh, I think, 400 million reads nowadays. Um, and if you're doing expression, roughly, sorry, roughly you want about 100 million reads uh, uh, to be able to do expression every uh, uh, everything else. So you can actually pull three to four, sometimes people pull five samples Per lane, if you're doing human uh, human uh, transcriptome, um, so that's uh, that's a lot of samples uh, uh, in a lane. Barcodes, correct? Yeah. So you have uh, uh, barcodes that, uh, and you don't have to worry about that. I believe the uh, the tool that generates the fast cues. They will do the, uh, the the decoding for you, so it will generate separate fast cues for each lane. So you end up with a sequence file for that specific sample, for that specific barcode, and the barcode will be in the name of the fast cue file. Yes. Has it ever been shown that there's a lane factor that you should consider when analyzing the data? So it's it's good to have, for example, just that I said technical replicates, so that when you're doing the pools, you make sure that the sample. Uh, will be distributed across different lanes because there could be some lane effects. It really depends on your flow cell and your run uh, and, and that day and the technician who did it and the machine and the chemistry that day. There are a lot of uh, variabilities. That's why doing technical replicates or running it on different lanes or different flow cells is very helpful because then you can get rid of those differences or biases, technical biases. Um, what mapping strategy should I use for RNA-seq? This slide is a bit outdated because uh, it's considering reads that are less than 50 base, uh, base pairs. Most of the reads nowadays are uh, 7,500. Um, I haven't really seen anything uh, lately that is uh, that short, like 50, 50 base pairs. Uh, so uh, it's, I, I recommend if you're doing a spliced aligner, by spliced uh, it means if you're taking your RNA-seq data and you're trying to align it to a human genome, um, you need a splice-aware aligner, so something that can uh, take the coding region and align it to uh, coding and intronic, uh, intronic regions in the genome. Uh, and for that, uh, bow tie and top hat combination is recommended, and we'll get into the details of why uh, I recommended uh, that in a bit. Uh, now, what if I don't have a reference for my uh, reference genome for my uh, species? What do I do? Um, one of the, the first things is, have you considered sequencing the genome? And if you haven't, then uh, now there are a lot of tools that does uh, de novo assembly. Uh, for example, just one that uh, comes to my head is Trans uh, is, is a great tool that does de novo assembly, um, but uh, for, for fusions. Now, you don't really, um, uh, we're not really covering de novo assembly in this uh, uh, workshop, and that's uh, it's outside the uh, scope of this workshop, uh, but there is a lot of material and tools out there that will do that. So you can still uh, work with uh, without a reference genome. That's still doable. So that uh, concludes the first part of today. Any questions regarding uh, introduction to RNA sequencing? Yes. Yeah, so, so what you're doing is you're looking at your reads, you're looking at overlaps. So you're trying to stitch the reads back to, uh, to, to come up with uh, transcripts or, or isoform. 
so you try to stitch them back and try to find uh, as, as many paths possible or isoforms that can explain the variation in your uh, data set. And you can do that at the alignment level or you can do it at the fusion level or, yeah. yes? Um, the, the kits now in, uh, available for like R, uh, for FFP samples, are they able to do the same amount of splice variants, um, all this other? Yeah, uh, everything is the same. So you can do, uh, if you're doing FFPE or fresh frozen, it should be the same. The quality might be a bit lower for uh, FPE compared to fresh frozen. So when uh, uh, you're looking at the quality of the RNA, maybe in terms of coverage, you might want to cover it more. You might want to sequence more uh, uh, lanes for that specific sample. But in terms of uh, bioinformatics, you can run the same exact tools. Or, uh, it doesn't matter. Yes. So when, when you were sequencing, DNA, you compare any variants you see to the genome of the patient. How do you do that? And here, you talked a little bit about de novo, which would mean yeah. you construct the genome yeah, yeah, of that patient yeah. or the RNA question. How do you do that here? Um, yeah, that'll be challenging because you don't have anything to compare to. And uh, I'm assuming that the error rates. Uh, you have to keep that, that in mind, the error rate of the assembly itself. You're going to generate a lot of errors while assembling those reads. Um, so there, there will be a lot of artifacts. So it's not going to be as clean as uh, data where you have a reference genome, for sure. Can't you, can't you go back to the reference genome? Let, let's say you, you discover an RNA that is fusing two different proteins yeah. from two different chromosomes. Okay. You can go back to the reference genome. If you have one. To the genome of yeah. the patient, let's say you have it, and see if there's a fusion there, right? Yes, but if, in terms of variants, that will be hard. Like if you're looking at uh, SNV single nucleotide variants, uh, that, will be, that will be a challenge. Um, so large, large changes you may be able to so see. So breakpoints might be a bit easier than uh, looking at if variants. Um, but even there, actually, you will also introduce some artifacts when you're trying to assemble. You'll probably have some false positive, false positive events in different data types. So there's no comprehensive map of RNA expression in a human cell that you could use as a benchmark? Well, humans, you, you do because you have a reference. So are you, so are you were saying the, things the that genome, don't... But not the RNA expression. Uh, not, not RNA expression, no. Yes, no. Is that possible? Well, it's, it, it, it's dependent on so many things. Because the tissues will have... The cells in each tissue will have different expression profile. Um, uh, each disease condition will also affect the, uh, the expression profile. And it also depends on like even the, the time when you take the cells, the different times will probably have, have different expression. Uh, so there's a lot of variability that I believe will be very hard to capture in a, a database. Yes? Uh, this is quality chain. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, quality chain. And, and the relationship between iron quality, basically, which now refers to the integrity, the how long, <coughs> how degraded they are. Mm -hmm. And then the relationship between the quality of iron and the read quality. I have have some data that's from all top sequence tissue. Uh, the real quality is really bad, but the win number is like about, about eight. Yeah. It's not tame. Really. Yeah. So each level of, uh, of uh, sequencing, you can introduce errors. So uh, it, it, the error could be at, in the sample itself, but if the sample is good, it could be the library prep. If the library perhaps good, it could be the sequencing. So there are so many different levels where you can introduce uh, artifacts or, or, or errors. You can do something uh, wrong. That's why for each one of these levels, it's important to do a QC check. Like when you're doing the RIN, you're checking the, 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 the RNA quality. When you uh, do the um, uh, sequencing, you check the FASTQ quality, and that will tell you if the RNA was good, and then all of a sudden the reads are, are, are bad, and something went wrong at the library level or maybe the sequencing. And based on your, uh, the, the report that you get, you try to ad identify where that error is coming from. Is it a sequencing error? Is it a library path error? Um, uh, is it, do you see it across, do you see the same error across the sample, all the samples that you sequence? Uh, if that's the case, then it's probably a technical error that you need to go and, and, and deal with. You don't blame the unequality itself, but as long as the length is like longer than your frequency size, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, our, I mean, Ren is just an approximation of. Uh, it's not. It's not uh, the gold stand. Like you, there might be something wrong with your RNA as well that Ren was not able to detect. Uh, I'm not saying that if you have a Ren of ten, that means the sample is great, but you have a higher chance of having a good RNA quality. Um, I believe there are other metrics now, I was talking to a lab technician, that they use to assess the quality of the RNA, which is better than uh, RIN. I can't remember the, the name so of it. It's an estimate of the size of it. What's the fraction of 200 dBT or longer? Correct. So I think they look at uh, everything, all the other regions, not just the two ribosomal. So here, and the RIN uh, is focusing on the two ribosomal units, and it's looking at the ratio of the two ribosomal units. Uh, the smaller the ratio, the lower the quality of the sample. But I think the other score is looking at all of the fragments and the RNA, not just these two. And that provides you a better estimate of quality. Yes. Um, so my, my concern or the thing that I wanted to ask is, unlike genomes, if we do a whole genome sequencing or resume sequencing, it's it is stable. Yeah. But RNA quality and overexpressed and underexpressed gene list is very dependent on warm ischemia time, when the surgeon plans the artery, the cold ischemic time, removal of sample to fixation and formalin or SMAP printing. Yeah. So, like some biobanks, NGVMF from Germany showed that endoscopic resection of colonic tumors, RNA-seq data, and after surgical resection, biobank specimen. One third to one fourth of the genes overexpressed and underexpressed fluctuate. Yeah. Um, I mean, the cost of not prolonging this um, thing now. Do you know of any resources or experiments where people have done to show that, for example, primary tumor RNA seq and xenograft RNA seq, it remains the same? I mean, I feel that we are looking at the signature which has changed. In yeah. vivo, it is not there. Yeah. And you're trying to devise diagnostic, prognostic, therapeutic biomarkers based on that. Yeah. But it's a snapshot which is not, I feel, really present. Correct. Um, so I, I don't know of any specific studies that have done that, but um, you're right. I mean, the environment uh, really affects the expression uh, profile, and any stress or, uh, really fluctuates the expression profile. And that's why replicas are very important, because uh, those samples are taking at different points, and if they're going under different uh, uh, environments and different stress points and you average uh, you're looking at consistency you're looking at things that happen across all these replicates even though they're coming from different environments so there is a higher chance that this signal is uh, true uh, but there are times when you need to adjust for these differences uh, before you uh, run your analysis but I don't know how you can control beside replicates I don't know how you can actually control for all these uh, variables because there are a lot of them, so it, you you might not be able to control for everything, but you try your best when you're doing replicates to control for as much as you can. Actually, one other things, but I will keep it for a coffee discussion more. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Yeah, actually, it has been done. Okay. Um, and it's surprisingly uh, similar. Similar. Okay. In, in different tissues, tissues and cells. Yeah. Surprisingly, comparatively, few mutations if any difference. I'll like to check that. Do you know the paper by any chance, or the? Uh, maybe. Anyways, so we can talk about it. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Maybe we'll share the article once you find it. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Any other questions before we move on to alignment? No. Okay. Um. So. Uh, in this part, um, I'll go over some challenges that the uh, aligners or RNA-seq aligners uh, face. Uh, I'll go over some of the tools that uh, are used in our uh, RNA-seq alignment. Uh, file formats, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, uh, with them or haven't uh, uh, touched RNA-seq or, or um, even like um, DNA alignments before. And then uh, we end with some QC uh, metrics, uh, things that you should look at in your uh, data sets, and I'll provide some plots uh, that will show you uh, how you can do that. Um, so some of the challenges 
bioinformatically um, when it comes to RNA-seq alignments is the uh, uh, abundance of the reads. So as I've mentioned, uh, as technology is advancing, you're getting more and more reads. And each lane of sequencing, uh, we're talking 350 to 400 million uh, reads that you need to uh, align to your genome. So um, you, in order to, to do RNA -seq, proper RNA-seq analysis uh, on human uh, samples, you're probably going to need some sort of uh, a compute node um, uh, that will be able to maybe parallelize the process depending on how many samples you, you, you're running. It will be a bit hard to run things on your local machine. Today we're running things uh, on Amazon instance, so that's another uh, option that you have to uh, uh, run those things, but today is not a good example of what a proper analysis is like because I've we've subsetted all the uh, uh, the sequences uh, to certain regions or certain chromosomes. Uh, but when you're doing the analysis, you're doing it on the whole genome, so it will take days uh, for things to finish. Uh, and just an example, Top Hat, which we'll be using for alignment, will require 16 uh, gigabyte RAM, um, uh, and it. And, uh, 8, 8 to 16, but it's prefer, preferred to have a 16 uh, gigabyte RAM, so you, you will need some computational resources. And not just that, you also, the files that you're generating, they're big files, so those BAMs, depending on how many samples you're dealing with, the footprint uh, will be uh, uh, big, so we need a lot of space to be able to store uh, those, those BAM files. Yes? You run them all in parallel? So, so that's what we do. So we run them in parallel. Each sample uh, will go to uh, run, will run on its on node. So it yeah. takes. It takes. So, so the process uh, takes about two days, and I'll get into the details of how long each step takes uh, when we go over the uh, alignments. Uh, another challenge is the splice versus unsplice alignment. Uh, you're taking, again, your reads, which are coding regions, and then you try to map them to uh, uh, intronics. So your reads can actually overlap two exons, for example. Um, and you're trying to take that read and you're trying to map it to a genome that has exon intron. And that intron doesn't exist in your read because it's RNA. There is no intron in RNA. And um, so, so you're going to have to deal with large gaps, large intronic gaps in the reference genome that you're trying to align to. And I'll show you an example, uh, we'll walk through it step by step as well. Um, and most of the time, you can't, you don't usually just run your analysis once and you're like, oh, I'm done with it, I'm never touching this again, uh, because tools update so frequently, uh, gene annotation itself updates so frequently, um, the, the genome itself changes as well, the boundaries uh, of, of the genes uh, change. So uh, most of the time if you're doing a project, you find yourself uh, going back, updating your uh, uh, re reference genome, updating the annotation uh, of the genes, and then rerunning everything again just to keep everything up to date, discover new genes, discover new uh, transcripts, and, uh, and be able to do proper uh, analysis and comparisons. So uh, aligners are actually split into three categories. There is de novo assembly. There is um, also uh, alignment to transcriptome and alignment to uh, the reference genome. And we'll talk about each one of these. So as I've mentioned before, de novo assembly is an option for people who do not have uh, the reference, their reference genome sequenced. Um, and it could also be an option for people who have uh, a reference genome uh, uh, sequence, but there is so much polymorphism in your data that when you try to align your data to the genome, you might actually introduce errors or, or, or will provide a lot of difficulty trying to map those uh, polymorphisms uh, to, to your genome. So it might be better to assemble uh, those uh, yourself. You can also align to the transcriptome, and that's just uh, uh, it's just a reference that contains all the possible isoforms uh, out there, and you're taking your RNA data and you're just trying to align it to all the possible combinations of isoforms. Uh, but uh, the most common method is alignment to reference genome, um, uh, and each one of these uh, alignment methods, they come with their own packages and tools and uh, that, that are available that you can you can use. Um, as you can see, this slide is kind of out of date, it's 2013, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how many tools are uh, being developed uh, for RNA, uh, DNA, how many aligners uh, are there. And, and, um, and what we picked 
uh, for this uh, for for today, we picked top hat. And now there are a few reasons why I picked uh, top hat. Top hat uh, was developed back in two thousand and nine, um, and since then, a lot of other tools have been developed, and a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard of Star and how great Star is and how fast Star is. And, uh, and I agree, Star is a lot faster. But as a beginner uh, to RNA uh, Seek, uh, I find it useful to start with a tool that's well established, uh, that's user friendly, that has a big community. Um, and, and community is very uh, essential because it, it, it means that most of the questions that you have have probably been asked before and they've been answered. So you can just go online, ask your question, there is an answer, someone has run into that issue before. And it also means that uh, they have worked on correcting all the errors that other people have, have, uh, have been trying to troubleshoot. So you don't need to go through uh, a tr troubleshooting process, which can be frustrating if you're just starting uh, a new technology. Uh, and so it's very unlikely that you'll run into that with Top Hat. Now, once you learn how to run one tool, it's extremely easy to just run another tool. All you need to do is just use another command, same files, everything, the workflow is the same, uh, just a few parameters, uh, gets, uh, they get changed and, and you can uh, go ahead. Um, so um, Top Hat is a splice aware uh, tool because it uh, uses the reference genome. Reference genome which consists of uh, introns and exon, and uh, so so it, it it deals with uh, splice junctions and tries to detect uh, splice junctions uh, from alignments. Um, so, what's the idea behind Bowtie and Top Hat? Um, so, Top Hat is using Bowtie as a backbone aligner. So, Bowtie is doing all the alignments. Uh, but the problem with Bowtie is that it can deal with large gaps. It, it, try, it can uh, try and align very large gaps. And when I say large gaps, these are the intronic regions. So uh, Top Height works as a wrapper around uh, Bowtie. It uses Bowtie to do the alignments. And then it takes that information and tries to do the assembly, or the splice junction detection and transcript assembly. Uh, and they work together to, uh, to do that. And I'll show you, I'll walk through how this actually happens, how the alignment works. So let's say we have two reads, read X and read Y. And read X actually spans two exons. And read Y spans one exon. The two reads are uh, the same length. And at the bottom, we have the reference genome. We have uh, exon one, we have an intronic region, and then exon two. So the first thing that uh, Top Hat tries to do, it, it tries to uh, employ Bowtie to align all the reads. It's going to take the reads and try to align them to the reference genome. And it takes read Y, for example, it aligns it, and it aligns perfectly fine to uh, the exon um, because it spans that exon. So it takes it and puts it in the align, align bin. Then it tries to take read X and try to align it to the reference. But part of the reads will align because that's the part that belongs to exon 2, and the other part will not align because it's, uh, the intronic gene region is, uh, is out. So it will take that read and then it will put it in the unaligned bin. And it will go through all the reads and do that, aligned versus unaligned bin. Then it will take the unaligned bin and then uh, go through all the reads in, in that bin. It will take each read and split it into smaller chunks, smaller segments. And then take each segment and then redo the alignment. It will go use Bowtie again to align that uh, uh, fragment, X1, X2, X3, to the genome. And in this case, X1 is going to align fine. X2 will not align because, again, there is still the, the boundary, the splice junction boundary. And X3 will align perfectly to exon 2. So what's Top Hat doing now, it's taking that information from Bowtie, all the alignment information, and it's trying to interpret and predict where approximately the splice junction could be based on that alignment information. And once it does that, it comes up with a splice library of all the possible splice junctions that you can come up with. And then it will take your reads and then it will go through the alignment process again using the new uh, splice library that it tried to detect. Um, again, you can also provide it with uh, uh, information about 
where potentially this splice junction can be, any uh, known splice junctions, so that it doesn't actually have to spend a lot of time trying to look for uh, uh, for things uh, from scratch, but it can use the known junction as a guide and then also look for novel junctions, combine the two. Is that clear or, yeah? It looks like it uses a backtrack recursive algorithm. Uh, a backtrack recursive algorithm. Thing that keeps going forward and matches and comes one step back and then goes forward again. Yeah, so I don't know if it's doing, yes, I don't know, yeah, I don't know if there is a, yeah, yeah. You can think of it that way. Yeah. So, so sorry. Yeah. Let me just think out this. So basically, it first tries to align things. If they align, great. If they don't, then it splits them into smaller bitsies and then tries to align those. Yeah. But then the bit about how it actually looks to see is it actually looking for predicted splice sites when it's yes. splitting them, or does so, it after the So first? the splitting happens uh, uh, just uh, size-wise. So it takes the first um, twenty-five bases and then twenty-five to fifty, fifty to seventy-five, seventy-five to one hundred. So it's not doing that uh, intelligently. It's just splitting according to size. And then it takes each uh, chunk. And you can actually vary the size. So I think by default is 25 bases. Uh, but if you have short reads, you might want to change that size um, uh, and, and make it uh, either. You don't want to make it too small, because then when you try to align, uh, it will not be as unique. Um, you want to uh, keep it long enough that it's unique. So yeah, so it's taking those small chunks, and then it's aligning them. And then things that don't align within that chunk give you an indication that there is a slice junction there. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, it's actually using also coverage information. So it looks at the coverage of the reads when it, when it aligns back to those uh, slice junctions to make sure that uh, it, it has done a, a proper job because the coverage should be consistent when it tries to assemble back the isoform or the, tra the transcript. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a coverage uh, search option that you can use to give you a better uh, estimate of those junctions, but usually they recommend that you don't run it because it takes a very long time uh, if you do it that way. Yes? So it looks like most of what comes out of Bowtie uh, reads that span uh, splicing junctions, right? Sorry, I, I missed the first part. Most? Um, whatever Bowtie cannot align yes. is spanning a splice junction. Yes. Right? Yep. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if you went into the detail on how Topad does it, but Topad takes only X2s yeah, yeah. and maps them against mature RNA, which has not spliced yet. So it doesn't do that. There is no reference. Is, is that possible? Or? Uh, I don't think so, because it's it's taking everything and just aligning it to the reference genome that you provided. Not It's not aligning it to a transcriptomic reference. But if you would, if you would do it, if there would be a way to take a mature and spliced RNA, then it can just take all those unaligned sequences and map them to the, to the actual sites, but they would be present. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't do that. It aligns it, it always aligns it back to the reference uh, reference genome. Um, and yes. So you said the, the, read, the read depth varies based on the expression level of some gene, right? Yeah. But the read length, you just arbitrarily set that when it comes to like, your experimental design? So the, the read length, um, uh, a lot of times, is uh, by default 100. It depends, unless you want to cut down on the cost and do, do less. Uh, but I wouldn't go less than 50. 50 is way too short. Uh, I would do at least 75 bases so you, and you more. That. That's when you're sequencing. So that's okay. like an earlier stage of the analysis. That's uh, when you do, before you even do library prep. Okay. You say, I want to do, uh, I'm going to sequence 2 by 75 or 2 by 100. And then you tell uh, uh, the lab that, and then they will construct the libraries uh, accordingly. Because you want to make sure that uh, also, the reason why I say you have to tell the lab, because they have to make sure that the fragment that they, they design is of um, uh, a certain uh, uh, length that will enable you to do it. Because if the fragments that they do, is they're too short, then you won't be able to do uh, a certain length uh, of reads. Yes? I just wondered, you said uh, you can choose what size you want uh, top hat to break up those reads into cameras. Yeah. But um, is it significantly more complicated it, uh, uh, it probably is because it's trying to, Bote is going to try to align and it will find a lot of um, uh, not unique map, 
uh, like or, or uh, sequences. So we'll map to multiple locations. Then we'll have to deal with that. So it's computationally intensive. Also, you will probably end up with a lot of false splice junctions because if it's mapping one chunk to multiple locations, then you're ending up with just random splice junctions uh, ever. So it's recommended that you, you pick at least 25, I guess. Um, and and it, Bowtie is also taking care of mismatches as well. So when it's doing the alignment, uh, when it looks at the, uh, at the read, uh, the default, I believe, is two uh, mismatches at the beginning of the read. And I think it allows more mismatches at the end just because the quality of the read drops um, uh, towards the end of the read. Uh, but that's another thing that you can alter, uh, so you can you can reduce the number of mismatches allowed, or you can increase them. Uh, that's that's up to you. Yes. Is it uh, once it does it once and creates another XD? Uh, does it split it again to another set of k-merge, or does it stop there and say, okay, this XD contains the splice junction? I'm just going to throw it. I believe it does it once. Um, now, while all of this is happening, should you allow uh, multiple map reads? So when you're aligning DNA, for example, um, the, you're trying to align the read, and the read maps to multiple locations, uh, depending on the tool, a lot of the tools will actually report all the uh, possible or all the potential maps, uh, mappings for that specific read. So if a read has 10 potential mappings, it will list all of them, it will uh, tell you what the quality score of each one of these mappings are, uh, and it's up to you. You can either uh, pick the highest uh, quality, because uh, that's probably the proper one, but a lot of times you get two or three map, uh, mappings that are, have the same exact uh, score. It's the highest score and it's the same exact score, uh, and those could represent um, uh, homologous sequences in the genome, so the read aligns perfectly to multiple locations in the, in the, in the genome. Uh, when we're dealing with DNA, some of the aligners, they will penalize uh, multiple alignments and it will re try to reduce the quality of that read just because it al aligns to multiple places because you want to uh, uh, reduce the error rate and false positive rate downstream. Uh, now, with RNA, um, it again, it depends on what you want to do after. So if you are doing expression analysis, you should allow multiple reads because there are probably homologous genes in the genome and you want to allow the reads to map to multiple places to get proper counts, uh, proper abundances. If you're doing um, uh, uh, maybe uh, if you're calling variants, then you might consider just not, not using uh, multiple mapped reads and only picking one of those uh, reads and, and going forward with that. So uh, uh, and on fusion, uh, same thing. You might want to keep the multiple uh, reads. Um, yes? Uh, in terms of repetitive sequences, would that be less of a problem, like RNA data, than DNA when you're aligning it? Or yeah, I don't know. Um, Gene, I'm trying to think like uh, gene-wise, is there more repetitive sequences than the DNA? I'm not sure actually. Um, that's a good question. Um, as I've mentioned before, so after you do the alignment, you get a, a SAM file or a BAM file. So a SAM file. For those who don't know what that is, it's just a sequence alignment uh, map format. So as I've mentioned, it's just the, the same sequences you have in FASTQ, but with extra information, where each sequence aligns, the quality of the alignment. Uh, BAM is just a binary version of that file, and it's a condensed. It reduces the footprint. It's highly recommended that you convert all your SAMs to BAMs. Um, how do you do that? There are a variety of tools. SAM tools, for example, is an excellent tool that you can use to do the conversion from SAM to BAM. And once you do that, you can just delete the SAM file. You don't need it. Um, so if you haven't uh, seen a, a SAM file or a BAM file, this is what it looks like. It's split into two sections. There is a header and there is a, a body to the file. Uh, the header at the top uh, um, has information uh, about the run, about the uh, workflow, about the lane where you've, if you're, you've done your analysis, uh, the command that you used uh, to run top hat, 
um, the parameters they used in, in, in Top Hat, Top Hat version, uh, sample name. So all the information that you need to be able to go back and rerun that sample again. Um, in the body, you get information about the sequences and where they are aligned. Uh, they also have useful information about the paired read, um, so where the paired read also aligned, and how far is your paired read from your uh, uh, the, uh, from your original read, or read one to read two. And you can use that information to actually construct insert size distribution. So you can look at the distribution of the distance between the reads, and that gives you an idea of the fragment uh, size that you started with. If you didn't know that before, you can construct the plot here, and I'll show you how to do that later, and uh, that will give you an idea of how big your fragment uh, is. Uh, also in this file, uh, forgot to mention, there is cigar string. So what that is, um, it summarizes each read. So it will tell you this read, there are five bases that matched, there is uh, 50 bases that did not align, and those represents the intronic regions, and then another 10 bases that mapped. So you can think of it as exon, intron, exon. And uh, that's actually what other tools use downstream. It will look at the cigar string, and it will try to interpret where the uh, boundaries are, the splice junction boundaries, from the cigar string for each read. Um, uh, so a lot of times, you uh, BAM files are huge. Um, you 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 can view them uh, using uh, like IGV or, uh, but if you're trying to look for uh, a gene, for example, uh, it will be very hard uh, to just do a grep or like open the SAM file and then try to look for that gene because the file is huge, the computer will probably crash. Uh, so to do that, what you need to do is uh, you need to generate uh, a text file called bed, a bed file, uh, where you can put in the gene that you're interested in. So you can put the chromosome, the columns that in a bed file a chromosome start and gene name so that's that's a, a bed a bed file uh, and then you, there are tools where you can pass the bed file and you can pass the bam file and what it will do is we'll go through the bam file and pull out those regions that you have in the bed file so you can generate a new smaller uh, subset bam file that you can distribute in the lab uh, you can use it to view things uh, you can use it to count uh, you can use it to look at coverage um, and so on. So uh, the bed file is very helpful. Uh, it doesn't need to be a gene. It could also be like a list of positions that you're interested in if you, uh, you're looking at variants uh, and what so. Uh, and you can do that for RNA-seq or for uh, DNA, any kind of band and bed combination. Um, and what tools uh, can you use when you're trying to subset a BAM file, um, there's SAM tools, there's BAM tools, there's Picard, BET tools. The two that are used uh, quite a lot are um, SAM tools and BET tools. Uh, BET tools is a great way to uh, calculate coverages. Uh, it, it generates histograms. It, um, it subsets files. Uh, it's 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 very it's a very useful very useful tool. Uh, and SAM tools is great because it, you can use it to, again, subset chromosomes, uh, view things, poll reads, and so on. Um, in terms of sorting your alignment, so now that we've aligned the file, uh, how do we sort it? There are two methods of sorting. Um, generally, the, the BAM files are sorted by position, and that makes the retrieval of the reads a lot faster for tools that need to just pull the, the reads based on position. It will be a lot faster if this, they're sorted by position. Uh, but uh, there are certain tools that require the BAM file to be sorted by read ID, and that will enable them to uh, easily assess the paired uh, reads and look for insert size and the distance between the paired reads. Um, and special infusion detection, it tries to find if one read aligns to one chromosome and another read aligns to another chromosome. So it'll be easier if you if they're sorted according to read. So check the manual, see what uh, how the um, the tool wants the uh, file to be sorted. Um, IGV, as I've mentioned, is a great way to visualize your alignments. Uh, if you haven't seen IGV, I'll walk you through what it looks like. It's a tool that you can download. Have you guys used IGV? today, or oh, lucky this week, excellent. Uh, so I don't really need to go through the details, but um, at the top you, you have the, the uh, ideogram, uh, and then at the bottom you have the, uh, the gene annotation uh, where the exons 
and the introns are, and the arrow uh, indicates the direction of the transcription, how uh, what strand uh, the uh, the gene is being transcribed, uh, and why I'm mentioning that because that you can color the uh, the reads, color code them to tell you what strands they're actually coming from, uh, just because. Um, uh, this was a strand specific library um, and they all agree that they're coming all the reads are colored one color which means that they're coming from uh, one strand and you can look uh, at that's the first thing I do I look at uh, the exon islands and I try to look at coverage and see if there is a match between the exon islands and the gene annotation and the coverage and there seems to be a concordance between the uh, islands situated at the bottom and then the the, the coverage track right there so you're seeing reads where they're supposed to uh, pile. Um, here are just a list of other tools that you can use to uh, visualize. Coverage. Yes. What was coverage pile up? Is that? So that's the count. So uh, it, what it tells you is the total number of reads that span that specific position. So well, it's, it's, pile up, it's up. not an artifact. It's, yes, so it's, it's summing really up all these reads. So, um, so this is a chunk of the reads. I should use mine, sorry. Can you guys see this? Oh, yep. Um, so what it's doing is summing up all the reads that uh, overlap this specific region. And it's giving you a count of all the reads that mapped that mapped there. So this is a, a chunk of the read, um, and then this is an intronic region. This is a gap that it tried to align, but it couldn't find. And then this is another chunk of the read, uh, another uh, splice. So it's using so IGB is using that cigar string that I uh, that I talked about, where it takes the read and it, it tells you this many bases aligned, this many bases were a gap, this many bases aligned, and so on. Yes. So um, the character lines in blue below are the exons, right? Yes. Yeah, so those are known annotations that you load. So right. you load that independently of your data uh, because you you know. Where the, the so, the G so it's telling you that you have a lot of pile up on sort of two ends over here. Yeah. And then very little in the other exons. Is that telling you about splicing? Uh, sorry, which exons? This, these ones? No, the the two big pile ups. Yeah, this yeah. and this. And that, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's dependent on the size of the exon, correct? The larger the exon is, the more reads that will cover it. So it's not telling you anything about splicing. Well, it, it is. Well, uh, the splicing, these uh, light blue lines, these are the splice sites. So what it's telling you is that uh, what you want is you want, uh, you want them to match. You want uh, the exon intron regions right. to match because this is uh, annotated. Uh -huh. This is your data. Right. So this is, your data is observed and this is the expected. And you see a match between the observed and the expected. You're right. seeing reads, sorry, you're seeing reads where you have islands, and that's expected, and you're not seeing reads where you have introns, and that's also expected. Sure, but the, the amount of expression, I guess it's telling you about expression levels, right? It is telling you about expression levels as so well. It's telling you that the small excellence are expressed at lower levels no. than, than the ones that have lots of phyla, or? It, it just means that there is less number of reads, just because of the size. We will talk about that in expression. That, you have to keep that in mind. So uh, in RNA, there is an assumption that um, uh, the abundance is related to the, the, the number of fragments that you observe. But large genes will have more fragments. Smaller genes will have less fragments. So you have to keep that in mind when you're assessing. So here, it's hard to just do expression. We're looking at coverage. And it's giving you an, a, a rough idea of what the coverage or the expression is like. But you can't quantify it by just looking at each exon. You have to normalize. Yeah. If you look at the exact splice site in line, that aligns with the exact splice site. Will that comparison give you any information about the level of expression? Not that entire area under the curve of that coverage pile up, but that exact uh, left hand side of that, you know, the line on the left, um, left hand side, the, the extreme left of the coverage part, wouldn't that amount give you the information about the expression? Uh, no, because uh, again, it depends on the size of the exon. So if the extreme left was a large exon, you'll probably have more reads. Um, and you have to also keep in mind that this can tell you about biases as well. So if it's a long gene, there could be a three prime bias. 
it could tell you about degre uh, degradation. If the, the RNA is degraded, uh, which in this case, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you can tell that, but um, you will see that the one end of the gene will have a lot less reads than the other end if the exon sizes are similar. In this case, it's a bit tricky because the exon is extremely small, the last exon. So because it's extremely small, you're expecting very small number of reads that span it. But if that exon was as large as the first exon or at the, at the three prime end, then you should expect the same level of expression or coverage, assuming there are there is no bias. But yeah, so the two things you look at, you look at the, the splice if they match, observed versus expected, which is good, and you look at uh, biases mainly. You're not re really trying to come up with an expression for that specific gene by just looking at it, it's hard. But it tells you, okay, how did my reads distribute across all the exons? Is it is it uh, fairly uh, uh, equal or is there some sort of bias? Yes? So how, how do we see the coverage in the intron area or the genetic area? There is no, there is none. So, so uh, if you're seeing some reads, that is... Um, uh, uh, it, it could be that, but it also could be um, uh, the, the splice. The splicing was not done correctly. Like the, there are some false positive splice junctions. Also, it could be that there are novel splice junctions because the the track at the bottom these are known uh, junctions, but you could discover uh, new junctions. Uh, I mean, there isn't enough evidence here. There are very few reads, so it could be these. These are probably errors. If it was actually a novel, it would be a lot more clear, and you'll see like big island of, uh, of reads uh, piling up in a region when there is no exon. That makes you think, okay, wait, did, is there another isoform that hasn't been discovered before that I should go back and investigate, uh, and so on. Is there a percentage you can tolerate, like less than 10%? I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have a threshold. Usually we don't do these things, because these are, um, uh, uh, you're not going to go through 20,000 genes uh, per sample through IGV, it's impossible. So uh, IGV is just a way to do, like if there is a gene of interest that you're interested in when you're doing the study, it's a nice um, uh, way to check and make sure that you've done things properly. It's highly recommended that you do a proper QC that looks at all the genes, looks at the whole thing, and we'll get into that uh, in a second. Okay. So uh, alignment QC assessment, um, I'm going to walk you through um, different ways that you can assess, now that you align the reads, uh, the amount of information you can get uh, about the RNA is a lot richer now. So with the RIN, it was very simple, it was just one number, and it will tell you if it's a good RNA or a bad RNA, but here you get a lot more information now that, that things have aligned to the chromosome, you know where the introns are, you know where the exons are. Uh, we're getting closer to expression estimation, uh, 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 but before we do expression, we want to make sure that the alignment was done properly. Um, so this is a list of uh, parameters. So uh, all these parameters I've generated with a tool called RCC, and uh, that's, uh, I think it's listed uh, in your notes. It's an excellent tool. There are a lot of our RNA uh, seq quality tools available out there. But uh, this seems to be um, uh, one that generates a very good quality uh, report, very comprehensive, um, so I highly, I highly recommend it. But feel free to generate your own, uh, own uh, report if you want. You can write your own script and uh, look at things um, your way. So um, bias. We just mentioned that uh, we can use IGV to visualize bias, but I said it's not um, uh, computationally efficient and what you want to do is you want to a tool like this to go through all the genes all the transcripts and then come up with a way to plot all of them and be able to tell you if there is any bias so the way it does this keep in mind that the transcripts they all have different lengths um, so to in order to get around this uh, issue what it does it takes each transcript and splits it into 100 bits um, or 100 quantiles and it looks for each of the quantiles, it looks at the coverage in that quantile for that specific transcript. And then it generates um, this plot, 
where the quantiles are uh, uh, from the five end to the three end of the transcript uh, is situated at the bottom, and then the co actual coverage is on the y-axis. And here you're seeing two groups of samples. One group of samples that has consistent coverage across the transcript, and another group of samples that seems to have a very low coverage at the five prime end of the transcripts, and then seems to have a very high coverage at the three prime end of the transcript. And one possible cause of this is the way that you have selected your RNA when you were doing the library. So this could have been a poly A selected uh, a library, and what happened is that it selected a lot of the uh, the three prime ends because those were the, the poly A's are are located, and um, uh, and it could also indicate there might be some uh, deg uh, degradation in your uh, RNA because um, the five prime end is usually get, get, is the one that gets degraded first, and uh, it's possible that that end has been degraded uh, while the three prime is intact, and that's why you're seeing these differences in, uh, in coverage between the two ends. Now, when you're dealing, when you're seeing this, it's extremely important that um, you, you detect it, you find out why this happened by going back to the library construction level, uh, and then you correct it. Correct, correcting for it is the most important uh, step. Because if you don't correct for it, what's going to happen is that this uh, error will, uh, uh, will go through uh, expression and will affect your expression estimation. How? If you have long genes, so if you take these uh, samples right here and you run them through expression um, uh, uh, tools or softwares, the, the short genes will have over uh, estimated expression values because uh, the shorter they are, the, there is more coverage on the three prime end. The very long genes will have underestimated expression values because uh, most of the five end of the transcript doesn't have any coverage. Uh, so you're ending up with two pools of overexpressed genes, underexpressed genes, and that's not good at all. So there are various ways and tools out there that can help you. If you can't resequence, if you can't redo uh, the prop, uh, then the tools will uh, correct for such biases. Uh, uh, across the genome. It's highly recommended though that you redo and get a better uh, because you don't want even the corrections to bias your results at the end of the day. Um, another thing that you can look at is the nucleotide content uh, distribution. So uh, in this plot at the x-axis I'm looking at the position within the read. So here I'm looking at very short read that 35 bases long. Um, and then the y-axis, I'm looking at uh, the distribution of the frequency of each one of the bases, A, C, G, T. Now, you expect, um, uh, uh, setting GC content uh, bias aside, you expect, if you're looking at the reads, you should have uh, uh, an equal distribution of the four bases. So each one of these bases should have a frequency around 25%. Um, uh, uh, if you look at all the reads in your, uh, in your library. Now, what ends up happening is that when we started plotting these, we saw that there were some funky things happening for the first 10 bases of the, uh, of the reads. So when we looked back and investigated, it seems that um, there is uh, random primers that Illumina uses. And those random primers, they're used to reverse uh, transcribe RNA fragments into a double-stranded cDNA. And they, um, they turn out to be not so random. Uh, after all, they they actually have a preference for uh, 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 certain bases when when they uh, they, they bind, and it, it causes these uh, uh, patterns. And um, there was a, a paper published, so uh, and they've also suggested a method of correcting for it. But um, what we do is we usually trim the first uh, ten bases of our reads. Um, because if you keep them, uh, we've noticed that the quality of the alignment uh, get uh, reduced because of the, uh, uh, the, the biases in the, in, the, in the bases in your reads. So we just trim the first 10 bases, and then uh, we continue with, your, with our alignment. Why do that the necessary that the random primer actually bind to the corresponding nucleotide? Sorry, why? Why would you remove this first 10 reads, uh, 10 nucleotide? Why do we remove it? Because uh, uh, you don't trust that binding from that random binder. Because we expect uh, an equal distribution of bases, so there seems to be a, 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 an over um, a 
so there's selecting certain bases when you're trying to enrich for the reads, uh, but we want uh, an, a fair distribution of bases in those reads. We don't want uh, uh, a preference towards certain bases versus others. But so that's why. That data that actually going to solve the problem? Because the reason why you have this enrichment is because the way how you build the CDMA library. I yes, guess. yeah, so yeah, yeah. Assuming that's not going to change the fact that these fragments are actually originating from base pairs that they're by prime end of the stream have the biggest bias. Yes. So I'm not sure how this is causing a mapping issue because these bases are not wrong. Uh, they're not, they're not wrong, but there's a, a preference. So so it could uh, the the number of reads that you get might not be fairly or like equally distributed. So you're getting more reads from certain uh, uh, areas versus versus others uh, potentially. Um, so the difference wasn't I mean it wasn't that huge, but it uh, it makes the alignment actually go faster because it doesn't have to deal with uh, these biases or patterns. Um, they do have uh, methods of correcting for it, but uh, I haven't actually used those. I just trim the first time bases and then uh, go ahead with uh, the alignment. Yes. And is it like, I mean, are the samples all the same? Right? Yes. The so you see the same, I believe so. Yes. So based on all the samples, as long as they're, uh, they're uh, alumina, then uh, you, you will see that pattern. Would this plot change if we take tumors with high GC content? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know how that will uh, affect it. Yeah. Question, yes. Uh, if you turn the first 10 bases, would you just never see the beginning of genes? Or like no, these, so those reads are equally distributed across the genome. So okay. think of them, the, I'm not, these are not localized in a certain uh, uh, area of the genome. Uh, all the reads are overlapping uh, across the whole genome. Okay. But we're taking all these reads and we're just determining the first the first few bases. So the overlap will still exist, okay. and we'll still get a full coverage of the whole genome. Uh, so it will not affect, like affect the position of the read, not read, the genome. Not the genome. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, not the gene, but the read. Yeah. Okay. Um, alignment QC. Another thing you can do is you can look at the quality distribution. Uh, uh, FRED score, if you haven't heard of uh, FRED, is just a quality that's widely used. Uh, to ca characterize the quality of the base uh, that you're trying to call. Um, and the way that this score is calculated, it's negative 10 times log 10 of uh, P. And P, in this, in this case, uh, represents the probability that the base you called is wrong. So if you see a FRET score uh, of 30, it means that there is a 1 in 1,000 chance that the base you've called is uh, not correct. And FRET score is usually, uh, that's, that's how quality is reported in your FASTQ file, in your BAM file. Uh, that's the standardized uh, quality score that's used. So what we can do is we can uh, look at the position within the read from 5 prime to 3 prime, and then we look at the FRET quality score distribution. And the box plot represents for that position um, across all the reads, what's the distribution for each one of these bases across all the reads. And you see uh, that, uh, uh, you, you want to make sure that the uh, the overall um, distribution is above Q30. So that's usually the standard to uh, have bases or scores that are that are higher than Q30. You do see a decline that uh, goes from the beginning of the read to the end of the read, and that's just the, uh, the, the all the sequencing by synthesis, synthesis techniques have that issue where the, uh, the certainty uh, of calling bases decreases as you reach the end of the read. Um, remember we talked about PCR artifact in DNA and in RNA. Uh, so this is one way where you can visualize uh, potential PCR artifact or, or duplicates. Um, so this plot is looking at, it's a bit confusing, so um, I understand if you, if you can't follow, but um, on the x-axis is the uh, occurrence of the read, so how often does the read happen? Do you see it once? Do you see two duplicates, three duplicates, uh, four duplicates, so on? And then on the y-axis is the number of reads that have that uh, uh, rate of happening. And what you want, ideally, you want uh, curves that go really deep. Because what this is saying is that very high number of reads happen at very low uh, occurrence rates. So it happens between one to ten times. while 
the uh, there are a lot of reads that happen, uh, very few reads that happen where uh, multiple times where they have like huge pileups, um, and this is done sequence based and mapping based. So they've compared the sequences, the exact sequence of the uh, the the, uh, the pileup, and also the mapping uh, start and end point to come up with this estimate. Now, if you see something like this, like up here, uh, which tells you there is very high number of reads that have very high duplication rate, then you might uh, go back and investigate why that happened, consider collapsing, or um, and check your PCR method to make sure that it's not introducing bias. Um, this, uh, this is one way you can check depth. Uh, remember how we said we, um, you can run a pilot study if you don't want to run all the samples. And then uh, from the pilot, pilot uh, study, you can take the BAM file that you've aligned and then try to figure out if you've reached enough uh, coverage. Is, is, have you sequenced deep enough? Um, so one way this tool does it is that it takes the BAM file and then it samples 10% of it, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, up to 100%. And at each level, it will look at all the splice junctions, known and no novel splice junctions. And then it will tell you the number of junctions that it detected from 10% of the data, 20% of the data, and so on. And what you're interested in, you're interested at a point where the no matter how many reads you add, the number of splice junctions that you're getting has saturated. If you add more reads, you're not getting any more splice junctions. There is, there is no point uh, uh, on sequencing more reads because you've reached that saturation level. Now, um, you look at the saturation level in two curves. You look at the uh, known junctions and the novel junctions. The known junctions, as you can see here, saturates a lot earlier than the novel one. And, um, and that is because a lot of the novel junctions are actually false positives. So um, you will still end up getting uh, uh, novel junctions because most of those are, are, are false positive. So when you're trying to decide uh, or, or come up with, with, uh, uh, with a threshold, uh, keep that in mind. So look at the nov known junctions first and then consider the novel and keep in mind there is a lot of false positives. So what this is telling you that, okay, well, maybe saturated at this point. So I don't really need to do... Um, 500 million reads. I can only do 20% um, of that. I'll only do 100 million reads, uh, and that should be sufficient. Then you go back and you set that new threshold for coverage, and then you run it on all, all your samples. Um, now, you can do this same technique. Instead of looking at splice junctions, you can um, look at the number of genes uh, that are newly introduced at each level of sampling. So you sample at 10%, 20%, and you look at the expression instead of the splice junctions and see, okay, now I'm seeing, as I'm increasing the depth, I'm seeing new gene families. New genes are being introduced. At what point do those genes saturate and I'm not seeing any, any new genes uh, being expressed? And you can maybe combine that information with the splice junction to come up with a coverage uh, threshold that you, will, you can use. Um, Base distribution, so here we're looking at um, all the bases that aligned and where they lie within the transcriptome. Are they within the coding regions? Are they within uh, intronic regions? If there is any, are they within a UTR, uh, intergenic bases, and so on. And um, these are nice because they actually show differences in your uh, library uh, techniques. So if you've selected total RNA, and our, our uh, ribo depletion, then you'll probably see a lot of, uh, you'll see less coding in the pie chart and a lot of non-coding. But if you've done um, mRNA selection enrichment, then you will see a lot more uh, coding uh, bases versus non-coding bases. So that's another way to confirm that your library prep went uh, uh, correctly, uh, went, went okay. Um, here, the, the reason of this slide, I just wanted to highlight a few terms that are being used in the community interchangeably, and it can get a bit, uh, a bit confusing. Uh, when, I, when I talk about fragment, I'm talking about um, uh, the, 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 the fragment and the, uh, the adapters. So that's the, the, the cDNA fragment that we're trying to sequence. So this is the 
the, the RNA fragment that we converted to cDNA, and then we're trying to sequence uh, this, this piece right here. So if we do single, L, single end sequencing, we start from uh, 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 this end right here, and then we do, if we're doing 100, uh, 100 bases, then we do 100 bases this way. Uh, if you're doing paired end, then we're doing uh, 100 this way, and then 100 uh, uh, from the other end, uh, 2 by 100. And the gap uh, in, in, in the middle is not sequenced, uh, usually. And that gap will vary depending on the size of the fragment that you uh, select and the, the, the read length that you, uh, you, you're doing. And ideally, you want to select uh, a, a read length that matches the uh, the fragment size, so you want to reduce the unknown gap uh, uh, distance. You don't want to go over it. You don't want to have reads that will overlap, because you can think of it as you get shorter and shorter fragment. If you keep the read length the same, you're going to have reads that will overlap. Read 1 and read 2 will overlap, and you don't want that, because that's just a waste of uh, resources, and because you're, you're ending up uh, sequencing the same base twice. And, and uh, it's not... Um, correct because you can't consider them as two calls because they're actually coming from the same fragment. So it's classified as one call. Then, then you have to worry about that when you're doing expression and, and, and variant calling. And you don't want to you don't want to worry about that. Now the three terms that are used interchangeably: fragment size, insert size, and uh, inner distance or inner, inner mate. So when we talk about fragment, I'm talking about the cDNA fragment with the adapters. When we talk about the insert size, I'm just talking about the cDNA fragment itself. And in inner mate or inner distance is the gap distance between the reads. And one of the parameters in Top Hat used to be, at least, uh, they ask you to uh, estimate the inner distance. So they ask you to estimate based on your library size and your read length. Uh, can you tell me what your uh, inner size is? Because they use that uh, as a way to judge how far the pairs uh, should be, and if it's further than a specific distance, then maybe they should, should classify them as a fusion, or they should um, uh, classify them as a tronic region, or what, uh, uh, so on. Um, but sorry, now I don't think they need to do that because they learn. So they pick the first uh, bunch of reads, and then they learn all these information from the reads themselves. So you don't have to provide that. Um, here I'm just showing you, if you're trying to call variants, if you have a gene, a specific gene that you're interested in and you want to look at variants uh, in a very inefficient way, you open IGV and you go through the gene and um, you look at a position and here um, these are the RNA reads uh, and this is the, uh, uh, the, the coverage for example and this is the reference genome saying it's a, a C and then the uh, alternate um, uh, bases uh, are here. So they're highlighted as uh, T, uh, so it's telling you that there is uh, a mutation in this site. To calculate the variant allele frequency, what you can do is you can just simply sum up all the alternate uh, bases and divide them by the total number of bases, and that will give you a frequency of that mutation at that site. Um, it's not efficient at all. You can use SAM tools pile up, which will go through every single base in the genome, and it will uh, do this, uh, it will do exactly this. It will look at the reference, the alternate, and it will give you a, a, a number of bases that are alternate over uh, the total number of bases. Uh, it's a huge file because uh, you're going through billions and billions of uh, bases. Actually, with RNA, it will be less because you're only looking at the coding region. So, um, so that concludes part two. Any questions regarding alignment? QC, visualization. No. Excellent. I think we're doing very well on time. Sorry. What you mention for that show, alignment QC? QC? R6C. That, that's the only one you recommend? Yeah, well, that's the only one I, I have used. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've used uh, multiple, but that was uh, one that provided me with all the plots that I needed. The other ones, I found that you there's one plot that's useful, and then I had to combine it with another plot from another tool. So it's, it's recommended that you run multiple tools, because um, uh, each tool has its own way of assessing uh, things, and it has its own plot. Ideally, you want to come up with your own uh, QC coverage, because that's dependent on your own project and your own, your own interest.
but just to make it easy, it's uh, you can use R six C. Okay, so now we move to expression. So now that we have the uh, the sequences of the RNA, we align them, we have the alignments, uh, all we need to do is perform expression estimation and differential expression. Um, so the learning objective of, um, of this part of the module is to uh, look at expression estimation, also look at some methods of normalization that are used by cufflinks, um, and then uh, jump into the differential expression uh, methods, and then uh, look at some downstream, downstream analysis that you can do. I'm not going to go into the details, because um, uh, doing expression and differential expression you can take a whole course on that. Uh, so it's really hard, I find it really hard to condense all that information in one. So I've only picked and, and focused on cufflinks to, uh, to talk about the method and how it works. And I'm not even like going into the details of exactly how it works, but I'm just giving you a background of the statistical model that's being used, how you can run it, and what you can do with the data. Um, there are a lot of papers that I can also point you at where they look at um, uh, exactly that. They look at various tools, how they work, benchmarking, uh, and then we'll, t we'll talk about that in a bit. But just, just keep that in mind. Um, back to IGV. Uh, so some people were saying, okay, well, I can look at the, the thing and then assess expression uh, from the IGV uh, plot. Uh, well, and, and, and I said it's, it's hard really because that depends on the size of the exons, the number of Vs that span it. Uh, one thing again you, that you can do is you can assess bias in, in uh, expression. Uh, so if you see uh, exons that have very high coverage at one end versus the other end, that's one, one way. But ideally what you want to do is um, if there is actually differential expression between two samples, if you load them, so you're loading sample one here, sample two here, and then the gene annotation here, that's known gene annotation, uh, and there is uh, if there is down regulation, then you should see um, uh, the, the coverage or uh, it will be reduced or will be uh, statistically uh, uh, different, significantly different between the, the two samples. Um, that's if you eliminate bias um, uh, first. Now, one way to normalize for the differences, yes? Where, where did you see the down-regulation oh. So, remember the expression peaks? or by, by expression peaks, sorry, I mean the coverage peaks. So if you compare the coverage peaks for that specific exon between the two samples, you see a reduction. But you have to uh, make sure that there is no bias first, correct for any bias that's present before you do such um, comparison. And again, this is, this is a coverage comparison at the exon level. It's not an overall expression, but just to give you an idea. Uh, so and this is what you need to do to be able to do that comparison that uh, I just mentioned. So one normalization method for cufflinks is, uh, is called FPKM. Uh, you might also have uh, heard of RPKM, which is another version. So F F RPKM stands for reads per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads. And we'll get into uh, how, what that means. FPKM uh, uh, stands for fragments per kilobase of transcript per, per million mapped reads. So the difference between RPKM and FPKM is that RPKM is looking at single reads, while FPKM is looking at the paired reads. So it's counting the paired reads as a unit, and the RPKM is looking just at one read as, as a unit. So in RNA-seq, the relative expression of the transcript is proportional, as I have mentioned, to the uh, cDNA, number of cDNA fragments that you have uh, sequenced, uh, or you've done in your library prep. Or you can say that it's proportional to the number of reads that you generated from cDNA. And, um, and you assume that the more reads, there is more expression. However, um, you have to keep in mind that genes, longer genes will have more coverage, uh, just because they span more bases. And also you have to keep in mind that the library uh, depth. So let's say we have two samples, one where we have uh, uh, sequenced three lanes, and another we've only sequenced one lane. 
it's not fair to do a comparison between the two because obviously the one that where we sequence three lanes will have a lot more reads covering those exons versus the one that only had one lane sequenced. So the two things that you have to keep in mind and normalize for are the gene length and the library depth, total number of reads that you have sequenced. And that's exactly what FPKM is. FPKM is taking those counts, uh, the number of fragments, number of cared ends that span your gene, and it div is dividing it by the total depth of that library and is dividing it by the number of bases in that gene. And that allows you to come up with a normalized unit that you can use to compare genes within the same sample and genes between different samples because it has been normalized by um, the library size as well. So um, how does couplings uh, work? So what couplings tries to do is it tries to um, take the, uh, uh, the paired and fragments and it tries to come up with overlap graphs. So all, it tries to assemble uh, the, the fragments, if there is any overlap between them, and come up with over, overlapping uh, uh, bundles. And it tries to minimize the number of paths. So each one of these is classified as a path. It tries to minimize the number of paths that will actually explain all the variation in your fragments. Uh, and each one of these paths represents an isoform. Uh, a, a specific a specific isoform. Now, uh, a fragment can belong to multiple isoform. So the, the way they quantify uh, the, the isoform is it's just a linear combination of the probabilities uh, of, of a fragment belonging to a certain path or a certain uh, isoform. Um, so once you quantify the number of reads per path or per, per isoform, each one of these uh, have uh, two things. It has an uncertainty. So if uh, a fragment belongs to multiple paths, there is more uncertainty uh, in, in that fragment, uh, uncertainty score. And then also it looks at the variability of that measure across all the replicates that you have, the dispersion across all the, the replicates. And it takes this dispersion, or uh, the variance between the replicates, and it combines it with the uncertainty score that it generated to come up with a new score, uh, the, 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 vari the count variance, that's what it is. And that count variance uh, seems to follow uh, some sort of parametric distribution. It's uh, called a beta non-negative -ne um, uh, distribution. Uh, might be throwing a lot of things that might not uh, be familiar, but uh, uh, if you really want to learn uh, more about the stats behind this, I highly recommend that you read, you read the paper. And it might be a bit complex still, but um, uh, give it give it a try. So after you come up with that variance score, the count score, you can just simply do a t-test that compares the different uh, replicates, uh, the variance between the different uh, the different biological conditions, and um, and you'll obtain a p-value uh, that you can use to assess which genes are significantly uh, different between samples. Now, in that process, um, there is uh, a step called cuff merge that gets used. So uh, think of it this way. You're taking each sample, and you're running cufflinks on that sample. You're getting uh, expression, and you're getting a, a transcript assembly. So uh, a list of all the transcripts that are available, uh, boundaries and so on, isoforms, within that sample. And then you do the same thing for the second sample, same thing for the th third sample. So you, and then you want to compare the three samples. You will have three different transcript assemblies, one for each sample. So what CuffMerge does, it takes those assemblies and then tries to put them together to come up with a unified assembly. And while it's doing that, it tries to filter any uh, uh, technical errors or false positive assemblies and at the same time it will make it a lot easier for uh, CuffDiff um, to or CuffLinks to compare uh, so it looks at a specific isoform and then it will look at that isoform across all the different condition and then compare the quantification across the different uh, condition, conditions. So that's pretty much what Cuff, Cuff Merge does uh, and we'll be able to run CuffLinks, CuffMerge and CuffDiff in the tutorial uh, that we'll have next. Um, also, uh, cufflinks and cufdic they come up with they, they come with uh, uh, an R package called uh, a cummerbund, and 
uh, it's extremely useful. They uh, list all the commands on their website, and um, what it does, it generates so many different plots uh, based on all the uh, output quantifications and differential expression file, text files that you generate after running GUFDIF. And it will generate things like um, distribution, the distribution plot, distribution of coverage across the genes. It will generate heat maps. It will generate clusters. It will try to cluster your patients to see if they cluster uh, according to the condition that you're uh, in interested in, if you see any difference between the conditions. Um, heat maps, I think I mentioned that. Volcano plots to look at the significantly dif uh, uh, different genes between the conditions, um, and so on. Um, so the, 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 there are two uh, sets of, uh, of, of tools that you can, uh, two pools of tools that you can use. Ones that use uh, FPKM or uh, normalized um, uh, expression values and ones that use raw counts. So with raw counts, the intention behind it is that you're not really interested in comparing genes within the same sample. You're interested in looking at that gene and comparing it across conditions. That's why you want differential expression. And uh, so, so you look at raw count instead of uh, normalizing, because once you normalize, that will limit the statistical test that you can run, because the distributions will be different. But if you use the raw counts, that will enable you to use more statistical methods to do comparisons. So you'll have more power to compare um, to, to, to do comparison between the samples. And uh, one way you can do that is uh, you can run HTSeq, which um, pretty much goes through the, uh, it's like the alignment step. It just goes through all the, uh, the regions of the genes and then tries to come up with a, a count of how many reads pile up uh, uh, across that specific gene or isoform or transcript. And it's, it, this is just a count, pure count. It's not normalized for gene length. It's not normalized for uh, library depth. And you pass these to um, uh, um, other uh, tools that will deal with counts and will do count comparison. They do some sort of normalization as well, uh, not FPKM, a different kind of normalization to adjust for the different library uh, depth. Um, And some of those tools are uh, DSeq and EdgeR. So DSeq and EdgeR, they're uh, uh, very similar. The underlying assumptions are similar. The distributions are, uh, are, are similar. Um, so you can give those a try as well um, if, if you want, uh, if, you, if you don't want to do the FPKM uh, method of expression. Now, um, there are papers that, uh, that have done benchmarking. So they've taken the samples and they've run them through all the different expression uh, analysis tools out there in hopes that they will find the best tool out there that they can use for everything. But what they found is that there isn't a single tool that will work with everything. So it really is dependent on uh, the, the conditions you're testing, the number of replicates that you're looking at. Um, uh, if you have more replicates, then some tools work better than others. If you have re less replicates, then other tools work them, uh, better than others. Um, and there the, and the papers where they do the benchmarking, they have very nice tables where they summarize the underlying distribution for each one of these tools, the tests that they actually perform. For example, DC can HR, they use a Fisher exact test instead of a, a, a t-test, uh, just because the underlying distributions are are, are different. Uh, one method that you can do um, if you want high confidence in your in your calls is to run them all. Uh, run two, three uh, tools and then look at the overlap. Um, so look at genes that appear to be differentially expressed across the different uh, uh, tools and that will give you confidence. Ideally you want to validate but if you can't do that then maybe that's uh, a cheaper alternative to validation. Once you get these genes, you can, if you have money, you can do qPCR, and you can actually go and uh, uh, look at the, the, the expression using a diff, completely different um, uh, technique to quantify genes to see if there is actually a difference between uh, the genes. Yes? So uh, if I wanted to validate a transcriptomic signature using the alternative thing like immunostochemistry, while filtering the gene list, is it better to look at the raw counts versus uh, um, FPKM? The objective is to short, make a cheaper essay. Yeah. Choose four or five immunostochemistry. 
chemistry antibodies and try to replicate the transcriptomic signature. When you say transcriptomic signature, uh, what do you mean by that? For example, like you look at gene expression models. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In yeah. Press, there are two signatures that you get off of. Yeah. So you look at all. And if you want to recapitulate that, yeah, yeah. Crudely, yeah, yeah. So that again depends on the number of replicas that you have. So um, if if because as I mentioned, if you have a lot of replicas, then some tools will, will work better. Um, uh, you might look at the count based versus the uh, uh, the, the FPKM. However, I'll show you in a bit. FPKM is mainly used for visualization. So if you're doing things like that, it's highly recommended that you do count-based methods, so you edge R or DSeq, or there, there are a lot of other tools. I don't want to sound unfair and not mention the rest, but there are a lot of other good tools that you can use. Um, but uh, FPKM is mainly designed for, if you're looking at heat maps, you're looking at like clustering, if you're doing these things, then uh, you might want to do that. But um, if you're doing machine learning and classification, as you mentioned, and signatures, it's better to use the count-based. Oh, question. Yes. I'm just wondering about TPM. Are you going to discuss that at all? With, uh, no, is it used? Uh, oh, sorry, what is uh, TPM? Is that a tool to million? transcript per million? Yeah. Um, and how is that calculated? Is there like a software that uh, you use to calculate it? Or? I'm not sure on the details, but it's just something that I've seen popping up here and there. Okay. I haven't seen it personally. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of other tools that you can use. Um, uh, I haven't uh, done uh, RNA within the past year, so I haven't <laughs> um, uh, processed uh, any new tools. Um, but that would be interesting. I would like to give it a try and, and check that out. Um, also, one thing to keep in mind when you're doing, um, when you're running these tools is that um, we're running, we have a lot of, we're doing these tests at the exon level or the gene level. And keep in mind that we have like 10, 10 and thousands of genes, hundreds and thousands of exons. So what that means is that you're doing hundreds and thousands of tests. So um, it's expected that you will get a list of differentially expressed genes by chance alone because you're doing so many tests. Um, so looking at the p-value on its own is not sufficient, and you will need to correct for the number of tests that you have conducted. And um, a lot of these tools, they nowadays they actually do correct for that, and they do multiple uh, correction, and they report the q-value, and that's what you're interested in. You're interested in the q-value, and if the q-value is above or below a certain threshold and not, not the p-value. Um, some downstream analysis, um, there is a lot of stuff that you can do with expression. You can uh, cluster them, uh, supervised, unsupervised clustering, um, and, and try to see if the patients uh, cluster according to some sort of a gene panel, a gene expression. Um, you can do classification. You can come up with a signature based on that expression through machine learning and try to uh, classify patients into high risk and low risk based on the, the expressions. Uh, profiles that you get uh, that will be very useful and random forest is a, a great utility that you can use to uh, to do that and that's a package in R which is also really easy uh, to use um, you can look at pathway enrichment analysis look at the genes that were differentially expressed and then see uh, what pathways they belong to and if uh, there are certain pathways that are enriched uh, and if that actually relates to the biology uh, of this, the question that you're trying to study. And we are 